Okay. Hello, everyone. Today we're with Jennifer Cross, a professional life coach and a trained, certified, fascinating womanhood teacher. For more from Jennifer, please go to www.fascinatingwomanhoodclasses.com. The link will be in the description below. Jennifer, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Thank you for having me. I am so excited that we found each other actually, because you've actually now, through me watching your videos and the people that you've talked to, I've been looking for you all for a long time. <laughs> so thank you for having me on. Well, you know, we've been looking for the kind of information that you're sharing with us. And so I think it's, it's a wonderful thing that we found each other. It is. I think the, the best way to start off would be by asking, why should women be interested in becoming fascinating? What are they going to get out of it and who else benefits? Oh, great question. There's so many great benefits to fascinating womanhood. Can I give you a tiny little bit of history? Please, please. Uh, thank you. Fascinating womanhood, the classic book, which I want to show you here because this is the, um, this doesn't necessarily look like the book that Helen Andelin wrote, but, but she wrote the book based on a series of pamphlets. She wrote it in the sixties. Okay. It had nothing to do with a counter feminist movement. Helen had just written it because she saw value in it and helping herself and then women around her. And it just coincidentally happened to be at the same time. And so it got a lot of attention. It sold more than now 6 million copies worldwide. And that was back then in the seventies and the eighties. So um, the movement for fascinating womanhood started there and now is reignited. And I have the pleasure of working with Dixie Andelin Forsyth, the oldest daughter of, Helen Andelin and her protege, and she rewrote the books. So now we have, you know, Fascinating Womanhood Vintage Edition and able to speak this message to a 21st century woman and, and man, family for that matter, because it's, and it's such a great message. So foundationally, the principles would never change. They'll always be great. But the message, of course, you know, we talk different. It's a different world than it was in the 50s and 60s. I mean, please, we've got double the population on the earth now. So um, fascinating womanhood, the benefits are this. I think it begins first with it teaches a woman how to fully enjoy her femininity and her womanhood that has been robbed from us since anyone 65 or years and younger, men and women. We have been damaged by feminism, by the evil part of feminism. And so fascinating womanhood is about bringing back femininity and inspiring women to live out that, that role and enjoy it. It has nothing to do with being subservient, submissive, weak. That is not femininity. And that's what is the, another part of the lie of feminism is this, that femininity is weakness. It is the most beautiful strength that there is. And um, so women have to gain by The Fascinating Girl, which is written for single girls or reading Fascinating Womanhood, any of the versions, is reclaiming their femininity, inspiring masculinity, and having a lifelong love affair with the man of their dreams, if that's what they want. But if they, at the very minimum, they will cultivate this amazing self image and confidence and become a mother to community. Lots of women maybe can't have children. Maybe they don't get married. Maybe they don't want to, and that's okay. It's about womanhood and embracing that again. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> that's wonderful. And I, I'm sure, you know, it's not just the women that benefit. It's everyone, as you mentioned, the community around them, uh, especially children. Uh, children yes. need their mothers, and a big part of the feminist movement has been separating families. Uh, you know, we hear a lot right now people complaining about separating families. Well, <laughs> feminists have been doing that for a long, long time. Uh, I wish another, we saw the outrage uh, about that for abortion. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, it, I think it's interesting you mentioned that she started writing this not as a counter to feminism, particularly. And I wonder if she even was really aware of a feminist movement happening, but what she saw, the weakening of the family structure, mm -hmm. that was pre-feminism, like before feminism came along. And that actually, I think, opened, opened room up in dissatisfaction in women 
to allow feminism to to take root. And the the key to feminism. And an sorry. No, you're right. It yeah. gave them an excuse. Yeah. And I, I think the the key to countering the negative impacts from feminism is not to fight about feminism. It's to help women learn the other way, the feminine uh -huh. way of living. And that's that's most women don't want to identify as feminists, uh -huh. uh, according to most studies around the world. And if they have if they know what else they can do they'll even be less likely to identify with feminist ideas, not just actually as a feminist. So I'm, I think this is absolutely great. Great. What would, uh, what would you describe as the ideal woman, the, the fascinating woman? Okay, so the ideal woman is actually a concept from those original pamphlets from 1922, actually. Um, so the way I, I actually, I don't know if anybody can even see this, but this would be a very rudimentary image of the ideal woman. And from a man's point of view, let me explain that. This is a, the ideal woman from a man's point of view is comprised of two aspects, the angelic characteristics and the human. And that's why you really need a class because I know already it just sounds crazy what I'm saying. But an angelic characteristic, for example, would be understanding men. A simple thing, you think simple, under, I was never taught. I was, and so the confusion, and I think a lot of the problems with relationships is we're always, women are expecting men to respond to them as if you, they, men are women. So when I get frustrated with my husband for not seeing the garbage can, I use this example all the time, that it's full. I get frustrated because he's not responding to the situation in the kitchen the way my sister would or my mother, because that's what I've been taught that the men should be more feminine, basically, in a nutshell, that's what it is. And so when I started realizing and understanding men, I wasn't angry with him. I mean, it just doesn't, you, we get the little tiny things just go away. You let go when you understand uh, he's focusing on so many different things that you're not focusing on. And that's not fair to expect him to see that when he's thinking of other things that are equally important. So, I just ask kindly, hi, honey, could you take out the garbage? It's as simple as that. So something that I could ruminate on for hours in the day to be angry about with him becomes, hi, hon, hey, would you take out the garbage for me? Becomes a, a chance for me to give him a kiss and a, and, and a thank you, you're so awesome. Or I take the garbage out, right? Instead of ruminating all day about, oh, he doesn't do anything around here. And then it's like this chain of, of negative thoughts that, only because you're not understanding how men think. So there's there's three whole weeks that we spend on understanding men, learning to accept, admire, appreciate masculine virtues. Um, I was not taught this as a girl. So when I first picked up the book, I was 24 years old. It was just, I mean, it was a wonderful thing. It was just wonderful. So we learn about angelic characteristics like developing inner happiness, cultivating deep inner serenity, this is a very attractive quality in women that we've thrown away to be CEOs and get the corner office while also trying to manage home. It's hard to do both. We fail. They end up in my counseling office at 40 years old because you fail either way. You didn't raise a family, but you got the corner office. Great. You got the corner office. You're alone. And women don't want that. Women want love desperately. All women. They're not even connected to what they're born to do, you were born with the ability to create life. It's the most amazing thing you, a woman can do. And it's so sad that it's sort of taken from us and minimized. So character, it's about a lot about worthy character, about becoming a domestic goddess and, and like saying that's okay to stay home and want to be a homemaker. Um, and then the other side, the human part, oh, about the angelic. This side inspires feelings of worship for a man, for a woman, the, that, that feeling like I'm going to put her on a pedestal. I just love her. My, my dad, he's 85. He said he was raised knowing women were to be put on a pedestal and they were on a farm. They were hardworking women, but they were all very feminine. And he always worshiped women. He was, they, women were treated with such dignity and respect back then in such a different way than now. And so the angelic characteristic 
characteristics inspire that feelings of worship and it brings him peace and happiness and love for you angelic celestial love the feminine side is human that radiant health the radiant happiness childlikeness which women have a problem with it's just girlishness it's fun don't i love, this the, is voice, the, I love, the, I love the you used when you when you asked your husband to take the garbage and it, even i can tell you you sounded like a girl you <laughs> sounded like a sweet girl when you said that and the way you smiled in your eyes showed yes a, a a a gentle sweetness how can anyone refuse that i think what's really important is your you know, a lot of men complain that women want to be put on a pedestal. Uh, the reality is they claim they want to be there without earning it. And you're talking about how they can earn it so that the man wants to put them there, not, yes. not feels like oh, I have to. You and, know? and right. And the woman feels like she deserves to be there. So I go into a whole thing about character and, and becoming an admired woman because there there's there's a balance there. Um, but I, yeah, childlikeness, girlishness. I want it, my when my husband wears his baseball cap on backwards, that man could get away with anything. It melts my heart. It is so boyish and cute. He's fifty six years old. So if you can, if men can be boyish and inspire that in me, literally, it melts my. I don't. I would forget everything if I was upset with him. If he's out mowing the lawn and that baseball hat's on backwards, he doesn't know this, by the way. Forget it. I don't care about anything, right? <laughs> I mean, so if boyishness works, then of course girlishness, there's nothing wrong with it. So that goes both ways. And so that the human fascinates, those human characteristics are fascinating to a man. It captivates him. It enchants him. It amuses him. So therefore, it will kind of diminish all these little things in marriage and relationships that we get hung up on can be diffused with childlikeness in a second. And you can go and have the best day that you've ever had with your husband, or you can have the worst. It's your choice. And that's what we mean by we hold the keys. I'll that's try not to be. That's lovely. No, no, I, I'm, I'm very happy to hear what you have to say. That's absolutely lovely. And, and I agree. Um, when you first when you first explain that, so I'm I'm reading some of the book and I see the angelic and human and see I'm I'm used to reading self help books and and things so I I can start to understand this but I really see how a course is going to help someone take it in deeply uh, when you yeah. think about it most women have had a lifelong course in in counter feminine ideas mm -hmm. and yeah it's so sad yeah and I I know this because we're both coaches so we we know this there's people get a coach to do things they can't do on their own. And if I, I even believe you can read a self-help book and it can do absolutely nothing. I know people who know exactly how to organize their schedule and their schedule is a mess. It's not a lack of knowledge. It really helps to take a course to see other women, to discuss things with them, to discuss things with the, the person who's leading the, the course and have that, that kind of feedback. It's so much more valuable than just a book. Can, can I put you back on that? Um, you, just to say the game changer is the one on one and, and from one coach to another, they can read the book, right? And, and then come to you or I, and then we talk about everything, but what is fascinating womanhood from my point of view, we will talk. And then we don't even talk about what they're learning in my FW class or what they're reading. We talk about why is it that you sabotage? Why is it? Do you want to be angry? You know, and, and just like, it's, so the one-on-one, -on -one, that's the game changer. It really is. That's great point. I really appreciate you mentioning the word sabotage yeah. uh, because I, I've seen this so often. Uh, things will be going along well for men and women. Mm -hmm. uh, and as soon as things get too, too real or too, too good that they can't imagine it. It, it gets basically the, the best that they've ever had. And then they can't imagine that what, what comes next, the uncertainty of the potential of the future causes them to do some sort of sabotage. And yeah, it's uh, br figuring out why you're sabotaging yourself is one of the, the most difficult things that a person can figure out in life. Because it's usually yeah. really deep. Mm -hmm. Very true. I, uh, oops, my, this is out of order here. Ah, so 
What are some of the common behaviors besides sabotaging themselves that women are engaged in that's harming their relationship? Oh, okay. I love this question. Thank you for allowing me to talk about it. All right. It's, it's casual sex. It's the number one worst thing a young woman can do. And so if we're talking about single women here looking for a relationship, it's the number one thing that will cause harm to you and to him and to a relationship if you were ever to have one. And so I have very strong feelings about that. And uh, so it, if it's a common behavior nowadays is that it's not a big deal, it's very normal and natural. But the reality is, is that at women, we're letting down the world, ladies. We are the gatekeepers to procreation and civilization. Okay, and a gatekeeper in a different way than what you mean, uh, Noah. But um, so we have to make sure that the men that we are going to have babies with are going to be there to raise them and take care of us while we are going through that process, which is an 18 to 20 year process to raise a child to a human adult who's well adjusted and productive in society. So don't minimize, sex will lead to a baby. That's, you know, use birth control, please. Absolutely. I don't want to get into that discussion, but that is the number one worst behavior that women are doing. And they're not only because babies are going to be born to single parent homes, but because women fall in love with men that they make love to, they call it sex, but you, the chemicals that are excreted for you, a man are different than what for me. So females, uh, we will, um, during the intercourse, there's more, I think it's oxytocin or one of those great happy feeling hormones. I don't know. It makes us fall in love with that man. So this, this is a, another lie of feminism. We need to have a book about all the lies. Casual sex is, is not, it's no such thing for a woman. She wants, she will fall in love with you. And then you wonder why she's kind of one calling why isn't he calling and she, then you're mad at him because he's not calling you but there was never any agreement that you were even dating this was casual but i really like you you don't even really like him you don't know him but it's a chemical thing that happens we are mammals so it's sort of like it's just na nature so watch that you know you are this is an important thing that we do creating human life let's that let's honor it again. We don't. I mean, people will have abortions and like, hush. I mean, that is going to be the greatest number one tragedy of the human existence. We're going, to, we're years going to look back on abortion the way, you know, in a hundred years from now, we'll look back on abortion the way that people today look back on slavery. That's right. And, and, or the Holocaust or any kind of genocide. It is, it is so scary. So that number one, but also not understanding men, so this behavior of this self-centered behavior, I say single women, the best thing you can do is serve your communities. Yes, of course you have to work and support yourself. I'm not saying not be educated, be educated. You must raise the people of the world, educate yourself in whatever that's going to be, be productive, but serve communities. People need you. You are a woman of the world of the, you know, of civilization. Well, it so we've forgotten our role. It used to be my my great grandmother told me that when, when she was a girl, when she was a girl, as as you were around twelve, you got some responsibilities, and she would have so many younger siblings and cousins that she was always looking after some kid at some point, some baby somewhere, and women would grow up like that until they got married and then had their own children, and so they were for them having a child was a natural thing to do that, you know, you, they did, all of them did more than a dozen times. Uh, and this was, uh, huh. was just normal. It was normal. This was how yeah. life was. And you would have so much experience. You'd have more mothering experience by the time you were 18 looking after your siblings than some women get in their entire lives. So true. And I really think for, for women today, if they can, so if they're not yet married, support their married relatives who have children, you know, go out there, play with the kids, take them uh, out to the park, uh, spend time with them and cultivate their mother, motherly instincts. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Great idea. I, I, um, my generation, I'm 51. I don't mind telling everybody. I was raised that, oh, you should be the wife and mom. I, and I was actually, my mom would send me to the neighbor's house to be a mother's helper. I was taught all that. I learned how to be a babysitter. I had younger siblings. I was taught that, but then in the same breath, I was told, you don't need a man. You better go to college. You need to be able to support yourself just in case you get divorced. So of course, my first marriage ended in divorce. I, I was like almost planned out for me to be that way. Be independent, but don't be independent. It's very confusing for women born in my eight, uh, the 60s and 70s, worse so than any other. Because at least in the 80s and up, it was all like, oh, forget it. You don't need a man at all. So they weren't, they don't have this dichotomous thinking that my generation does like, which is why a lot of, by 40 women just collapse and it, it's so confusing and you just feel like a complete failure no matter what you do. Um, so. Well, and the women whole, that emulate masculine behaviors, they find out that they're not very good at being men. No. I oh, I love that. Dixie's always saying that. Yeah. They get to be 40 rather, and find out they're neither good at being a man or good at being a woman. That's a terrible place to be in. It is. And thank you for saying it. Dixie's always saying she would rather be a first rate woman than a second rate man. So true. I love that. Point. Mm -hmm. So this type of a woman, uh, this fascinating woman, why is she attractive specifically to good men? Um, or why is she attracted to good men? Yeah. No, uh, why, why are, why are good men attracted to her? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, all right. I took notes. Um, okay. One in the, in the fascinating girl, there are six secrets to winning men. And that's a terrible thing to say. And nowadays, totally politically incorrect, but I, it's a secret I, to winning them the right man. And I always say, you know, attracting Mr. Right at the right time and not Mr. Right now, because Mr. Right now just wants one thing usually. Not always. And everything I say is always take it with the bell-shaped curve. I'm, I'm just talking in general. There's no way I can talk any other way. So there are secrets to winning men. And it begins with understanding men. It begins with your worthy character. I got to say, let's start with, it begins with character. <laughs> and you're not a yes as a man. You could probably tell me. <laughs> well, you know, with, with, with my wife, um, when... You know, due to due to the disloyalty that's so common in women nowadays, the thing that attracted me to her is her attitude towards marriage. It was, you we're going to make it work or die, <laughs> you know, oh, or die trying. And mm -hmm. there there was uh, the the option to split up, the option to not make it work, and that was just not there. That was not an option. And you know, she was she was a virgin when we got married, so was I, uh, and these these were decisions we made because we knew in the long term this would give us the most happiness yeah and her character how she cared for other people uh mm. how she was concerned about other people and her attitudes towards fidelity marriage and sex outside of marriage made me absolutely confident that she will never leave me or and never cheat on me and that was that was the beginning. So that's was the minimum. Then I started to get to know her because there was no point in starting to allow my heart to, uh, to be given to her before I knew that she would be loyal to me. And I think for her it was, was the same way. It was a lot of the same type of, of attitudes that attracted her to me. And I, I absolutely, character is very important. And we actually see feminism purposely sabotaging women's character nowadays. And mm -hmm. that, that's something a lot of men complain about. Um, yeah, they've ruined women and, and also they're, they're starting, well, they're trying to ruin men. I don't, it's so confusing to me, but, um, I wanted to say the next thing I was going to say was gaining his trust. And when you were talking, my goodness, you said exactly that is that when you trusted her, that she was really that kind of a worthy woman, you were like-minded then, and then you sort of were able to give yourself a little bit more to her. And um, the other, the third thing is admiring masculinity. So any woman raised nowadays, what, what do we hear? Toxic masculinity. Nobody even knows what real masculinity is anymore. And if it, if we do, then we think it's negative. I just have one thing to say, who's going to fight the wars because it's the men of the world that protect you all. 
and not that women don't, but men are more naturally inclined. You guys are able to compartmentalize these things that would damage women forever if we had to do them. And you are specifically designed to be able to protect and provide us. And the fact that we are trying to nurture that out of you is the demise of civilization. I mean, it's like try to, to nurture out of the lion his desire to protect his pride. Well, I mean, example, my, my wife will tell me, oh, don't, I'll mention something that I read in the news and she'll say, please don't mention that to me. That's too disturbing. I can't I, handle I have to remain sweet and, and gentle with my son. And if I hear those disturbing things, uh, it starts to stress me out. So women don't even do well hearing the disturbing so things. How would they do an actual, um, in an actual war? And a lot of people think wars are things that happen far away to people we don't know. That sometimes is true, but it hasn't been, you know, the United States is that every once in a while in the West, we, we had wars in Europe just a short time ago. It was a little bit before that there was a civil war in the U.S. Um, anyone who doesn't think there's tensions across the Western world now isn't been paying attention. That's what's so scary about the liberal thinking. How do you think you have your life that we have? It came at a price. Yeah. And well, you know, hard, there, hard men carved civilization hard. out of the wilderness, principally for yes. women. We're, we're fine living in a shack in the wilderness and oh. in the forest, as my grandfather said. They, you know, we, we, we'd be fine doing that if it wasn't for women who we love so much. We built civilization and indoor plumbing and lights and electricity in a warm house so that our women and children would be happy. And, and so that you could come home to that. There's nothing in the world more important. We all want to just go home. That yeah. you, we go to work and we eat women. You, but who's caring for that home? Nobody anymore. So And, and so many young wow. men have given up on the concept of it. Uh, yes. I saw, I think... It wasn't with you. I'm not sure. Uh, there was an interview with someone from the MGTOW movement. Um, yeah, that, that could have been, yeah, Sergey. Yeah, he was the most rational MGTOW man that I've heard. Uh, that's why but, we spoke with him, by the way. You which? That's why we spoke with him. Yeah, yeah. That's why I figured. I figured that. And mm -hmm. there are so many young men who've completely given up on even the possibility of it. You know, they're very concerned about statistics as if it's a, a gamble of some sort and it's all random numbers. Uh, and this is the collapse of civilization. When men no longer have anything to fight for, they fight for everything. Wow. And, or or you get conquered, one or the other. And we've, we're in a cross. I think the here. men have gone, gone frozen, just gone frozen. Uh, you know, pizza, beer, and video games. Who needs a woman? I'll just buy her. Uh, the MGTOW movement is very scary, but I get it. We totally understand why women is it's our fault. Yeah. Stop. It's I, I honestly, I, I, I deeply believe that the start of feminism was partially men's fault for abdicating their patriarchal duties in communities. Thank you. And I, I think, I think it had a lot to do with the rise of rampant alcoholism in the mid 1800s. And I feel like you and I could be brother and sister. Yes, exactly. I believe I say it's alcoholism really did. And men let us down a little bit. So the yeah. women had to come in and then it was. Well, the, the first women didn't want the vote at first. They wanted right. dry, dry areas. They wanted no alcohol. OK, but that's a law. You, lawmakers do the laws to get elected. It's just people pleasing. And <laughs> they only got the they only wanted the vote for the purpose of voting against alcohol. And after that, they didn't care. And then once they got that power, they thought, well, maybe we should do this little thing. And it's the normal thing of humans. We want to incrementally fix everything, and it's not possible. And men allowed that to happen. If men had, had kept check, and it's not just on ourselves. My no. obligation doesn't end with me. It ends with all of the men that I consider part of my in-group. Mm -hmm. I'm responsible for policing myself first and then them. And mm -hmm. they're responsible for policing me. Men didn't do that to each other. Society broke broke apart. Maybe it was the big distances. Maybe it was the new frontier allowed people to mm -hmm. get away with behavior that wouldn't have been accepted in established communities. I'm not sure why. Yeah, but, there's probably a lot of reasons. Oh yeah, there's probably multiple reasons. Men's behavior deteriorated to a point where feminism became attractive to women. 
Mm -hmm. Because our, our, our ancestors, they would not have been thinking like feminists today. They would have been thinking like fascinating women. Because if they didn't, they probably wouldn't get married. No man would want them. Uh, the, the whole concept of the fact that we're, as women, okay with murdering our own children, um, that, that that to me, is it says it all. And I'm not talking about a medical uh, abortion because of the life of the mom. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, a choosing to end a life of a human because it's inconvenient for you as a woman. There is an interesting yet rather disturbing book called The Origins of War and Child Abuse. And it talks about how in primitive cultures, about 50% of children were murdered by their mother. And part of becoming civilized human beings was we put an end to infanticide. infanticide. And now we've brought it back again. We are devolving into primitive minded people. Very much. That's a great point. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yep. Barbarians, uh, uh, cultured people can become barbaric when we need to be. Barbarians cannot become cultured when they need to be. There's, there's a limit to what they can do. And right. as, as society becomes more barbaric, more uncivilized, we're going to see a breakdown of the structures that we call civilization, our lights being able to turn on and having water. We see it happening in places like South Africa where they, you know, middle of August, they're going to run out of water. Yep. You know, 20 years ago, that oh would have been unimaginable. Mm -hmm. And we, we need to, to change that. And I absolutely agree. That for, for me, I don't see the change coming from politics. Uh, I started my project to start the change in the individuals creating better families. Yeah, it's the family that will change. It's the family that made, well, we say in America, is the family that made America yeah. great. One of the reasons it makes countries great, the family. So, yes, it, it will be okay, I think. It'll be okay. And I think um, mm -hmm. very often difficult times uh, end up weeding out bad ideas. So we're hitting some difficult times and people who are governing their lives by bad ideas are not going to be able to survive what's coming. They Though, really aren't. <laughs> no, th those who are. <laughs> like bio on a biological basis, if men continue to marry men and women marry women and I don't know, I don't see that. Everyone. This if everyone who doesn't like children doesn't have them, and we do know that personality is partially genetic, at least close to 50%, depending on what study you read, uh, what will happen over time is, is the people who do have children will be the only ones, ha the people who want children will pass on the genes of enjoying family. The I traditional cultural, And they'll pass on their culture to their children. And yes. Things will correct themselves, but it'll be messy. The self-corrections are always messy. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I think point. Great. let's, let's uh, continue on. I'm curious, though, what a fascinating woman would be looking for in a man. So if you're a man okay. and you want to attract a fascinating woman, how would you do that? <laughs> okay. Uh, a fascinating woman would be looking for a man who will make a great pr protector provider. That's it. Someone who is a family man who wants to protect and shelter her so that she can live her full role as woman, um, as her, as his helper. Um, and so, so where do you find this man? Well, he's working. That's where he's working. He's working. He's hard working, <laughs> you know, so go, maybe you work, you know, that's maybe where, but with the knowledge that when you're raising your children, you will be home. And so the two of you, if you're like-minded, you can figure out, I did when in the nineties, we had one car, we didn't go on vacations. I walked to town and I was able to stay home with my daughter while my husband worked and we didn't make a lot of money starting off and we bought a house and everything. So, I don't know that men, good men are working. So there, but also communities, churches, I think community, that's another reason for community service, um, philanthropy type of projects. I, I just, I, if you're involved in any sort of religious community, yes. uh, because I would love for men, and this is what I just know I've read about you, and you're wanting to inspire men to take care of the women again and the dating and controlling that because I could have really used help. My dad had no idea what to do. We, he was told, go let her do her thing. I, it was bad in college for me. It was bad. I mean, we need, women need to be protected from other men and from ourselves. We don't know. We're naive. There's, well, and, and women naturally have to have a high level 
of um, of of agreeableness. It's one of the five basic traits. Great point. They have to yes. be very agreeable to deal with infants. Everything about yes. women, their psychology and biology is based around having children. Uh, as right. a man, I have to realize my wife doesn't exist primarily for me. She exists primarily for the children. And, and mm -hmm. I get secondary benefits from all of that. And that that agreeableness is necessary to deal with a screaming infant at three o'clock in the morning when you're already tired, especially when you got multiple children. The problem Thank is you. that agreeableness. Yeah. And men, on the other hand, are disagreeable because we have to deal with stubborn animals and stubborn other stubborn men. <laughs> problems and, yeah and problems and i mean if we gave up over everything Big if problems. we if we allowed nature to bend us to its will we'd all be dead right we have to right. bend nature and the world and the universe to our will and mm -hmm. that requires a certain iron fortitude that allows a, like i always say there's there's two ways to measure men they are either good at being men or they are good men now you can be both uh, if you are good at being a man, that means you have a lot of masculine characteristics. So you are assertive, you are physically strong, you are able to lead other men. And then being a good man is virtue, such as honesty and integrity and uh, loyalty and the other and, and um, uh, tenderness and the other things that make a man good as well. And mm -hmm. the thing is, a lot of times men are good in one of those areas. They're good at appearing very masculine but they're vir without virtue. Those kind of men, women have a terrible weakness for this because they see the, the, the protective and the potential for them to be strong men and they hope that they can help them develop the virtue and that doesn't work. As, as a fascinating womanhood book talks, you can't, you can't change your man. Uh, That's so great. Better. Yeah, and, and we, we, we aim to make him number one and all of that too. So yes, children are important, but in a, a fascinating womanhood life, uh, the, the man is number one, yes, but absolutely. that's wonderful to hear you say that. Um, yeah, I, I thank you for saying that. So how can, a fa oh yeah, well, we sort of covered that already. Um, here's a very important question. There are some bad men, like I mentioned, how would a yeah. fascinating woman protect herself against those men? Okay. First, it kind of starts with let's not marry the Mr. Wrong the first time around. Like, so we need your fathers and brothers and husbands and male friends in our lives to protect us from the bad guys. Now, if you happen to get married and people change, things happen. If he begins to abuse you in any way, we're not about staying in an abusive relationship. So that's terrible for children. Uh, and for you, obviously. So no, you would have to leave. That's why it's called the sweet promise. So every woman, uh, even when she's married, what if a husband becomes sick and uh, God forbid he's killed? You would need to be able to support those children. So the fact that the, the idea that women should be totally dependent, that was a lie again of feminism to make you feel like, oh, I better not be too dependent because what if he divorces me or what if? Well, yeah, what if? You probably will. Women, you will have to work. We went back to work to help through the war to support our guys, right? So that's the sweet promise. Women, he needs to know that although you are you are home caring for the children and he is taking care of all of that, that in the drop of a hat, you could come in and if he was sick, you could pay the bills. You could make sure the lights can shut off. You could budget your money and be frugal. These are all things that have, that are important feminine things that women should learn and they will support the man. They're not negative. I don't know. I it's hope right. I answered I like the question. I like what you mentioned there about the, the, the feminist lie that there's either you're a hundred percent dependent or zero percent dependent. Yeah, it's very codependent to me, the almost, feminist. <laughs> yeah, almost all the feminist lies are based on some kernel of truth. And then it's distorted. Yes. In fact, very black and white thinking. Yeah, the, and, worst, yeah. the worst lies. I mean, I mean the most the most persuasive lies in civilization, in, in culture, are lies that are partially true. Yeah. Uh, because they, what they will do is they'll point to the partial truth part, which you can't argue against because it's true. And they will say, therefore, we must have, and they have a twisted or distorted outcome uh, to it. And I think that that's very important what you're saying. Um, you know, it, it's, and part of that is uh, husbands creating space to 
for their wives to continue to have skills. You know, yes. it's very important. It, it's a little different. Like, um, like I said, my great grandmother's time, they had at least 12 kids, every, every single one from that generation. I think that was the least number was 12. Some of them had 16. If you have 16 kids, you probably can't work outside of home. But by the time you're in the middle of that, some of your kids are already grown and they can look after you. Okay. So it's a, it's a very different situation. But there's so they, many things like, like I actually worked this job so I could be home and do this international coaching from my home and take care of my husband and my family and grandkids. And you can, women, there's so many skills that women have quilt making, sewing, those thousands of different skills that women are uh, great at that can make you a little extra money at home. Yeah. My wife does after school clubs with kids with for yeah. uh, science and technology mm -hmm. and stuff. The great thing is she can take my son with her sometimes. You know, depends if, if he's up to it or not. And so that means that he gets the fun of being in a, a, a and learning too. She's with kids all the time, which she feels very comfortable doing. And it's uh, a job that if she if she put a couple more hours in, would be enough to, for the family to live on. So it can great. Some, That's and, and this perfect is, ideal situation. Yeah, some some of my friends know that I was uh, very very ill for about ten years, and for. In the middle of that, at the worst part of my illness, I couldn't work. You know, I, I nearly died. Uh, and so now now I'm healthy again, but it took a while. And my wife, she kept everything together. She held everything together. And, you know, she and, handles the money management in the family. Yeah. And that works yeah. well for us, you know, especially since we live in a non-English speaking country. She speaks a native language. If there's any bills come in, she can understand them much easier. And so it's, uh, yeah, I, I think... When we want to have a traditional family, we doesn't mean an exact copy of what we did in the 1850s. Yes. No, it means it means having the men be men and the women be women, mm -hmm. and then finding out how they can divide things and make things work and uh, make the home life work with modern realities. Yes. Well said. Exactly. So if an abusive situation arises, you must have built hopefully community around you, uh, a support, families need support, whether it's Christian community or just community, friends, the lost art of the tea party, women each other again. But, but so many women are working, they don't have time to develop friendships, and then they do feel alone. And so what's their answer? Divorce, because I make 50 grand anyway, so I'll just take the kids, and then you remarry some other guy who ends up abusing your children. So I don't know, or you, and then you leave him. I mean, the scenarios go on and on. And it used to be, it's all bad. we used to have huge families, so a woman would have, you know, maybe five sisters and five brothers, you know? And if something happened, yeah. got all this family to take care of her, to help her out. And even, um, you know, just when she's, when she's in that period between giving birth in the first month or so, when it's so difficult for them, she has all this help. Nowadays, everyone's isolated. We're atomized. This is one of the things that I, I push all my single clients first, create a community around you and then worry about dating. It's, it's dangerous. Great. It's dangerous Great to date people you don't know. You know, um, if, so if, true. If you meet someone through other community associations, if I'm going to introduce someone to a, a woman I know, I have to make sure that both of them have impeccable characters. Otherwise, I'm I'm going to somehow get the the blowback if it doesn't work out right. And so, yeah. friend to friend introductions that gives you the best possible matches. I love that. I should I should write that on my list. I don't have that, but yes, absolutely through. Yeah people who know you. I honestly, I would have saved myself a bad first marriage if I would have listened to my parents who said, he's not right for you. That's the other thing. <laughs> um, but I was taught to be independent, be my own woman. So, but, so there was that voice there, but then there was the little homemaker voice, but Jen, you just want to be a wife and mom. Oh, be quiet. Just, just, you, no, that's not what women do nowadays. That's <laughs> silly. Yeah. And, and, and it's, our friends are very important. We need friends that we trust that are going to be honest with us. And we need to be, have the humility yes. to accept, especially with men. I, you know, I, I, I coach men and women and I get them together in uh, separate groups so that they can it's call cool. things out because men don't talk the same way around women and neither do women talk the same way when there's men around. And the men are, our, our idea seems to be to, to pound out the weak links. <laughs> 
And we really were tough on each other, but we wow. need it. We need it. And we love it afterwards. And it's like, if you're in this group, we think you're already good or we wouldn't have let you in. If we keep you in here, that means that we are going to make you even better. Now, the men, men can make other men better as iron sharpens yes, iron. Absolutely. You know, the face of one man sharpens another. It doesn't work well for what wives to try to improve their husband. But this is why oh, never. couples, couples who have where, where the man has his friends and the woman has her friends will have much better marriages than couples where they completely 100 percent rely on each other for all social interaction. It's, it's not the way we were created. It's not how we should live. Amen. That's all I have to say to that. No. You're right. Now, yeah. something I think is very important since we're, we're both coaches to go uh, to mention is yeah. what role do you think that coaching can help uh, can play in helping a woman to become fascinating and meet her relationship potential? Okay, great question. It's going back to what we kind of said, or you said it in the beginning, the the one on one relationship with someone removed from your, your life. So it's a completely non biased ear hearing. First of all, it's just someone to talk to people, we need to be able to talk to someone, right. And then offering that tiny bit of guidance that that opens up that, that mountain of clarity, like, Oh, there was the answer. It was in front of me all the time. You know, that's, that's what the coach does. It's sort of the guide through this journey. And we don't talk about fascinating womanhood. How do I understand men? Well, I can just, you read that in the book. Why can't you love your husband the way he needs to be loved? Or why can't you stop self-sabotaging? Or why do you get so angry when he doesn't, say thank you over one of your meals that's i'm talking about me <laughs> i thought about this because i was like made the most awesome dinner and jeff was like eating it and left and i was like crushed and i was like jen he is not a woman your mother would have praised you for that you know he's just you know it's it. so i let that it go it's just free he ate it and that's an endorsement of the meal yeah <laughs> you yes so well said and that could have again women then you would have gone six whole hours ignoring him cold shoulder all the stuff that we do so that's what coaching is helpful in. it's like why can't i be deeply have inner happiness why doesn't he put me on a pedestal i don't know the, the whole one-on-one -on -one, um coaching is so great it's to me it's more effective than counseling and i know i've done both so counseling, not that I'm ripping on counseling, it's fabulous, it, it's uh, it's necessary, but coaches are deliberate, it's very specific and it's quick, I think. It's in, in getting to the solution because we want to solve our problems quickly. We need help now. So that's the reason for right. the one-on-one. -on -one. What I didn't have, I had the book for 25 years. It was my best kept secret. I couldn't talk to anybody about this book right here since 1993 until i became a coach and was coaching women in health and wellness they were getting healthy losing weight feeling great feeling beautiful that's a whole other component of we didn't even talk about and then they wanted love and i thought oh no jen you got to talk about fw because this is the only thing that works and so then i i'm like well i don't care i was old enough by then i was like i don't care i'm gonna and then i lost some clients but then I've gained a whole new life and, and it's an amazing, amazing adventure and to have the book rewritten too. But I hope I answered your question. I get a little off, but that's a woman thing. That's okay. No problem. <laughs> no, it's, it's, um, you were mentioning the contrast between counseling or therapy and coaching. Oh yeah. And I, I, I tend to describe it to people that therapy is how you deal with your past traumas and uh, how you overcome them, unearth them, overcome them. And, and bring yourself up to a, a level of normal, normalcy. Yes. Their uh, coaching is how you, when you're at that level of normalcy, how you make your life extraordinary. It's how oh, you go well. beyond what you could do by yourself. It's the doing. It's like, you know, the how do I do it? How do I really change? Okay, I know I've had the trauma. I can experience it, the trauma without feeling that horrible feeling again. Yeah, I love, thank you for saying that. You just said in way less words than I did. <laughs> it's, the difference it's it's amazing because um a lot of people they'll say to me you know I, i've had three or four sessions so far and this was more useful than three or four years of therapy 
And yes. therapy tends to progress slowly because uh, it's not saying you need to, you, you have anxiety because you're not doing the things you need to do. And that's your brain telling you that you need to do something differently. All anxiety gets blamed instead on some past trauma. Well, the past trauma might be why you're not doing the thing you should do. <laughs> Just, it's like, are you unhappy? Just start smiling. Like, oh, you know, so I, true. You know, practice. I'll have people show me a smile. What does a smile look like? And I will get them to 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 bite a pencil so they smile. Yes, I love this. You do that a little bit, and do you feel better? Yes. Maybe part of your problem is you need to do different things and your anxiety will go away and then you can deal with your past trauma. You know, I, yes, I, and I have to just segue. You just, I have to segue into this because I know we're about ready to wrap up. But that's what fascinating womanhood for the timeless woman is all about. It's, it's well, not all about. There's a lot to it. But that's the next book coming out. And I know that's one of your final questions. Yes, I, I'd like to know a little bit. What is the workshop uh, cover? And we talked a little bit, actually, we already talked about why they should attend it is to, to, to have that direct impact. You can mention more, but I'd also like to know what's coming up in the future regarding the Fascinating Womanhood book series. And also there's the Fascinating uh, Girlhood. Uh, our girl is one as well. Fascinating Girl, there's so much coming up. Uh, first of all, uh, if you were to go to a workshop or a, a class, an online class, we talk about things like what is celestial love, the ideal woman, what becoming the ideal woman, how to accept, admire, appreciate, making him number one, um, understanding the masculine pride, offering sympathetic understanding, how to listen, what is feminine advice, how to give feminine advice. This is one of the best things we teach. Um, the role of, of a woman, the role of a man, becoming a domestic goddess, how you can embrace that. Um, we talk about femininity, that's a whole chapter. Uh, radiant health, radiant happiness, and child likeness. That's in a basic class. Um, and then I have classes before you even get into FW that really are foundational, like self esteem, self confidence. And um, so you will, we, in order to even become a fascinating woman, you have to deal with all of your, if you're insecure and uh, that we have to deal with what's going on with you person. It's a character thing. That's why the whole thing is about character and uh, starting and women are so great where we love knowledge and we love that self improvement. So this is great. We start with that. And then after fascinating, this is fascinating womanhood vintage edition. So this is what we're teaching now. And unfortunately, I don't have the new cover, but the cover is beautiful and it's something like this. So this is the book, The Fascinating Girl. Um, I do classes for ages 10 to 14 and then 18 and up. Um, so that's for single women, obviously, and talks about a lot about self-esteem, teaching girls to be girls and enjoying girlhood. Um, we also have the updated vintage edition of All About Raising Children. So as you can see, this is a, becomes a beautiful library when we when I have my cover. So girls really like this. Okay, so get the hard copy book. This is a beautiful series of books. And then we'll have the vintage. And then, so here you have this. And then the one coming is timeless. And that will be out, Dixie, will, we, I think will be out at, by the end of the year. So um, I would love for you to talk with Dixie, Noah. And that's something we can talk about later. But the other thing I want to... Add, and you may not know about this, is the, the book her father wrote, Man of Steel and Velvet. I heard something about that, and I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated to know more. Oh, yes. So you will love it. You will love it. It is a, a book that badly needs to be rewritten, and I'm sure the men of the Forsyth and Andalin family are going to do it. But right now, everybody's working on the updates to Fascinating Womanhood and reigniting the movement. I'm training the teachers, so if you're interested in doing what I do, training and teaching women all over the world. I talk to women in Australia, Saudi Arabia, United Kingdom, Germany. It's so fantastic. It's the most fulfilling work I've ever done. Well, besides being a wife and a mom. <laughs> I, I, I really but, um, a course like that would be wonderful to be taught by a either a husband, wife team or a man and woman who could explain things from both sides. Because I, I do know sometimes uh, my clients will say, I am so glad to hear this 
from a man's perspective. You know, they will they will talk to me about what their boyfriend or a man they're interested in is doing, and they'll say, "Is this normal behavior?" And I'll to, as me as a man, I'm like, "Yeah, I know exactly what he's thinking," but it's incomprehensible yeah. for them to understand what he's thinking, and and it's it's a big help to have both a masculine and feminine perspective on 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 that. We'll be looking for Dixie and her husband, Dr. Robert Forsyth, who helped her write Timeless to be doing that. So that, and then, then we would be hopefully training men and women teams to be teaching this in their living rooms. And this is how Helen, Helen just had a huge movement because women just were teaching other women in their living rooms. I'd certainly be interested in knowing more. Fabulous. So uh, thank you very much, Jennifer, for speaking with us today. Uh, where can viewers find more information about the Fascinating Womanhood book uh, and the other books in the series, as well as the courses? Okay, just easy, fascinatingwomanhood.com. That's where you can learn all about Helen Andelin and her family and, and now Dixie, who's kind of taken, we call it the teacup and, and uh, you know, brought it into the 21st century. Um, that's where you can sign up for the classes. You can see all of the teachers that we have a certified teacher page where you can see all the teachers we have all over the world. Not a lot. We just started training them over the last year. Um, but, you know, we do online. So online classes, in-person classes, one-on-one um, -on -one mentoring. Uh, so everything's at fascinatingwomanhood.com. There's a great blog. There, you can reach out to Dixie there and send her a message. Uh, we have an awesome, very awesome YouTube channel where you can see some videos of Bob and Dixie that I recorded um, of, of them doing some exchange. Those are great videos, so we've got to do more of that. And um, YouTube, Facebook, our big closed Facebook group um, is for women only. However, we do have fascinating womanhood in the 21st century, which I'm trying to build into a co-ed place for really intelligent discussion about the current problems and solutions. And, and maybe let's hook some people up. Yep. And I think uh, your community. Let's make some marriages. Is going to be beneficial for all of us. Thank you, yeah. much, Jennifer, for Thank sharing you. your time with us today and your expertise on this subject. And it's been an absolute pleasure getting to know you. I feel the same way. Thank you, Noah. It's my pleasure. And I hope we can talk soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.